Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, October 31st, 2022. Coming up on the show today, from the new indie film American Murderer, writer and director Matthew Gentile. So I'm leaving the company. I'm going to the elevator. And this young guy who works at the company goes, hey, man, I got to tell you something because I like you. I think your movies are good. But those guys are not going to read your script. And editor Matt Allen. Editor Matt Chesse came to AFI and talked at AFI. I was there. I was a second year fellow. And we met and we really had a synergy. You just kind of find your people in Hollywood. And Matt was one of those really generous people that really kind of took me under his wing and was really teaching me a lot about editing. Yes, all that and a lot more in this edition of The Rough Cut. Well, all right. Happy Halloween, kids. I hope it's a good one for you. Nothing too scary on tap for you today on the podcast. The film we're talking about is a scary title, American Murderer, but it is not a scary movie. Unless you consider the prospect of making an indie movie to be scary, which it can be. But it's also fun and exciting and collaborative and a real adventure in filmmaking. Our guest today undertook that adventure. Undertook? Have undertaken? Undertook. I don't know. I still don't know why it's lighted instead of lit. Regardless, today we are joined by the film's writer and director, Matthew Gentile, and its editor, Matt Allen. Two friends who met in film school and would ultimately join forces to jumpstart their respective careers in the film industry. Together they have, along with many other talented people, made this true life story that stars Tom Pelfrey, who was awesome in Ozark, he was Wendy Bird's brother, and Ryan Phillippe and Adina Menzel and Jackie Weaver. Not too bad for an indie cast. Now I know that for many of you out there, indie films factored into, or will factor into, your journey into the world of media and entertainment. And that is for no better reason than that their low budgets and maverick DIY approach to making movies often means that they rely on craftspeople who are just starting out and probably willing to take less so they can dream big. And American Murderer is no exception. So taking into account how important indie films can be to everyone's career, I thought we were probably overdue to explore that scene for 2022, soon to be 2023. How might the process and landscape be different today than when you veteran listeners were starting out? And for those just starting, this will give you an idea of what you may be heading into. Before we head into our interview and meet Matthew and Matt, I will warn you now, we are a little heavy on people named Matthew in this conversation, so try and keep up. And while you're keeping up, let me tell you all you need to know about getting great music for your next project, indie or otherwise. Probably especially for indies, because if you're pinning your hopes and dreams of filmmaking glory on your indie movie, you want it to sound amazing. And the best way to do that is to call our friends and Rough Cut sponsor Extreme Music. For 25 years, they've been helping filmmakers and other artists like you with the best in production audio. Music created by multi-award winning musicians and composers. Names you know and maybe a few you don't. But they are all super talented in the art of music making. All you gotta do is just go to their website, sign up for a free account, and what more could an indie filmmaker ask for than free, and then start your search for any kind of music you need. You can get your tracks in all kinds of shapes and sizes right down to the stems. It's fun, it's easy, it's gotta be easier than making an indie movie, and it's all right there online. Or they can lend you a hand from one of their many, many worldwide offices. There's always new music being added to their amazing catalog, and if you want to hear some of it, you can also check out their Spotify playlist. So, young filmmaker, if you want to make your indie flick sound awesome, make sure you partner up with our friends at Extreme Music. Okay, time to talk a little indie filmmaking. From American Murderer, here are Matthew Gentile and Matt Allen. I'm here to support, and I'll just write off his coattails. That's how it works. (laughs) Oh, man. I thought what we would do is I thought we'd start off by talking about what you were both doing professionally. Prior to joining up for this film, what were each of you working on? Matthew, as the director, let's start with you. Well, you know, I graduated film school um, in 2015 uh, from AFI, the American Film Institute for Directing. Um, You know, I graduated. I was lucky to have two short films that I did kind of back to back because I ended up getting invited to direct a film for some of the year beneath me when they dropped out and I was hired. So I kind of had this like post year where I was employed by AFI to direct a second thesis film. So by 2017, I was pretty much running around the festival circuit with two movies. I was doing a lot of, you know, freelance gigs, but I was in a time where, you know, directing like commercials or, you know, branded content, that kind of stuff, living kind of on a case by case project basis. And then, you know, around this time, a lot of people were asking me, you know, what's your first feature film going to be? Because that's really the big question for, I think, any director, you know, is how how are you going to get this first feature off the ground? And uh, I didn't really know which one it was. I had a couple different vehicles, you know, that were in assembly. So I had one like really small movie I was going to try to make for like $10,000, just go for it, you know, 
um, and like try to raise the money on Indiegogo or Kickstarter and like do it that way. I was kind of inspired by the Duplass brothers, even though my filmmaking style is completely different from say what they do. I found them really inspiring and their movies really good and just how they would go about it get, and you know, get it done, just be scrappy, get it done. And um, I was thinking about doing something like that, but I didn't quite have a story for that. You know, and I think a budget reason usually is not a good enough reason to make a movie. So I was figuring out, you know, what's that movie going to be? What does it look like? There was a, a thriller I was offered by an agent um, for a company, a small movie, like a 500K budgeted film. And, uh, but it was tricky because I didn't write it and the writers didn't want to change anything. So I realized if I was doing this movie that I wouldn't really be able to do something I wanted to do. So I was kind of in, you know, in this in-between phase. And I realized that if I wanted to make a movie that had my voice and, you know, was something I wanted to say, I was going to have to write it myself. And, you know, I went to AFI for directing. I would sit in on screenwriting classes all the time. But, you know, I had a lot to learn about screenwriting. I didn't really, you know, I kind of always thought to myself, mm, I'm more of a director than I am a writer, you know, but that's it. I grew up writing short stories all the time and writing plays and putting them on kind of like Max Fisher and Rushmore. So, you know, I, I had that kind of like, I did love writing, but I didn't know that I could like to the thought of being like a professional screenwriter seemed a little bit like, you know, cause you know, the odds of being a professional screenwriter, there are as many people in the writer's guild of America as there are in the NFL, right? It's, it, it is actually the same. So it's very competitive. And I just thought, I had this traction with directing, like my shorts were getting a lot of attention, all that for that. But, you know, the screenwriting, I was, I was, mm. but then I realized if I wanted to make something that was mine, I had to. So I really buckled down. I started to write the script on my own on spec and began the journey of becoming a professional screenwriter. While on that journey, I was able to get uh, a job also reading scripts for various companies. I can't say who just because they've asked me not to in this phase of all the movies coming out. Um, but you know, a lot of like respected organizations, all list a few, so they can get lost there. WGA, nickel blacklist, right. Companies like that, that read scripts for people and like help writers get attention. And it really helped me that job because that job taught me that job. Plus at the time I was doing that job, I was also my screenplay for American murder was optioned by Charlie picture show company and GG films. And I was, you know, employed by them to give notes and to improve the material. So I kind of had this dual education going at the same time where I was reading scripts, giving writers feedback on their scripts while I was also working as a writer uh, at a very beginner level. And so that really was where I was before we got to go shoot this movie. And it was about a year and a half or two of that before we got to then cast the movie, get into a really thorough pre-production and shoot the thing and then edit it. Mr. Allen, tell us a little bit about your story. So before American Murder, I was a studio assistant editor. So doing a lot of assistant editing on big studio feature films and really got very fortunate to work under some really great editors. I think the big break for me is Matthew and I both went to AFI. And at AFI, the one year that editor Matt Chesse came to AFI and taught at AFI, I was there. I was a second year fellow at AFI. It was the one year he was the head of the editing discipline. And we met and we really had a synergy where he was teaching everybody, but we together had kind of a, you just kind of find your people in Hollywood. And Matt was one of those really generous people that really kind of took me under his wing and was really teaching me a lot about editing, the craft, the politics, kind of everything you need to know as an editor. And I was very fortunate that right out of school, Matt hired me to go on to Disney's Christopher Robin as an assistant editor. And so I kind of got thrust right into these studio feature films, started doing a lot of studio feature films as an assistant editor, and was kind of in a way preparing for an opportunity to edit. But I thought I got very fortunate that I got to watch so many great editors work. And because you pick up so many things of how malleable is footage? How does someone handle it when they get director's notes? What do they do when the producers walk in or the studio execs walk in? And so I think there's a lot of valuable learning of watching and really paying attention. And yes, you have to do your job and be really locked into what your job is, but be aware of your surroundings and watch what other people are doing. And maybe when you get the opportunity, you get in the chair, you can emulate that. So what you're saying is that Matt Chesse, the professional editor, mentored Matt, the young editor, so he could work with Matthew, the director, and they could talk to Matt, the hack podcaster. One of us has to change our name to Carl. Is there a bad inside of Matt, inside of Matthew? It's an yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, moving on from that. So you're both at AFI. Is that where you met? Yeah, that was kind of the, we, we were kind of friends at AFI, but we never worked together on a single project. We were two years apart, you know, and 
we the way I met Matt actually was I was working on a short film um, that the short film I was hired to direct that year after Matt was just starting, I think at AFI. And I had heard he was, a, I heard he was a smart fella. They, they, you know, they, they chatter around the Sony digital arts center. They're like, Oh, this guy's good. This, this, this one's good. You know? And I had heard some things. Um, and this was that year Matt's talking about where Matt Chesse had started and I had the chance to meet him too. And he's just, you know, he's just a great guy. He was so generous and, with his time and was running such a good program and you know everyone was excited about him him being there any film school would be lucky to have an oscar nominated editor you know running their their program right and it was a real gift uh that we had for that was it one year matt it was right it was basically matt at the head of the discipline was one year and then matt's gone back and done a lot of guest lecturing yeah but anyways so the way i met matt was uh i was working on a short and we needed some, you know, you always need fresh eyes and post. And I just said, oh, well, let's ask that guy to come in. He's, he's, you know, I heard he was, I heard he was good. Let's get him in. <laughs> and so he came, Matt came in and watched my short and he just gave me really honest, smart, articulate, constructive feedback, you know, and, and it was just really like, you know, just his eyes were like lasers. He was just looking right through. He saw everything I needed to fix, you know, and I just remembered, I kind of was like, okay, after that, I was like, I've got my eye on that guy like he's he's smart he's good he's creative he has good instincts and but he's constructive and he's not someone you know because there's always like when you get feedback there's <laughs> there's all kinds of feedback right there's some people who are just negative sometimes and you're like okay i don't want those like i want people who you know i want people to tell me the truth and tell me if it doesn't work but i also you don't also don't want people who are over praising because that's not helpful right and that just satisfies your <laughs> ego which is dangerous so it's like you know you got to find people who really like tell you the truth are creative are artistic are disciplined and that's what Matt is in space. And it was very clear to me from that moment. So we became friends after that and buddies. And we would go, you know, we'd go to TCM Fest together, and like have a beer every now and then and talk movies. And, you know, it seemed like we had similar tastes. But, you know, Matt, I'm sure, could talk about how that parlayed into a, a professional working relationship. But, you know, it, it was, yeah, it started that we met in the AFI orbit. But we weren't uh, classmates. Uh, some of the people in the movie were, but Matt and I were technically not. So for both of you going into American Murderer, whether it was story or whether it was budgeting, whether it was production, just what were the things that you were concerned about going into this film? Well, I'll, I'll start by saying that Matthew Gentle has a very big, ambitious vision, and it's good, but it's very ambitious. And I remember reading the script and being very excited because I think Matthew writes in a way that's very exciting as an editor. He likes to do time jumps. He likes to do intercutting. He likes to mess with time, which is something as an editor I really enjoy. And I think that's kind of one of our superpowers really we get to play with time as an editor and the things and stories that Matthew likes to do he does like to play with time a lot and so I think that was kind of something I was really looking forward to but also in a way was like I got to bring my A game on this and but I knew all the people that Matthew was assembling were really A players and it was exciting to be part of this kind of great team there was a lot of zeal a lot of really focused positive intensity throughout the whole kind of pre-production and production process but I mean, a lot of it was just how ambitious things were. There were sequences, there were action stuff that was going on. Um, and that's kind of why we kind of discovered this way of working together in pre-production where we did pre -biz. And I kind of got this idea of working on with Matt Chesse on Disney's Christopher Robin. We were on a pre -biz stage and we were at third floor and I was watching. These guys are spending millions of dollars on this. And obviously we don't have any kind of money like that. But the idea got really ingrained into my head because I would sit with Matt Chesley on the stage and watch how things were working. The DP was there, the director there, Mark Forrester, who's amazing to watch. And I was like, OK, Matthew Gentle has this really ambitious vision. How do I help him kind of get some things in a place where maybe he has a shot list of 25 shots, but maybe he only needs 14? Or maybe there's four of those shots that he doesn't need, but there's three new shots we can discover. And again, it's all just as he, as Matthew likes to say, and he'll probably say it a million more times, is be prepared, but be flexible. And that's something we talk about all the time in the editing room. But I would say just kind of seeing how ambitious the production was going to be, uh, kind of in post, we realized that it was going to be a very music heavy movie. And I have to give a big shout out to Scott Gentile, our composer, Julian Drucker and Jules Zucker, which were our two music supervisors as well just because we have a lot of needle drops throughout the movie. 
Uh, and again, I think Scott Gentile did a fantastic job with the score. He's so good at doing feedback. He's so positive and is ready to like do another version and is such a great classically trained musician and conductor. We were very fortunate to have somebody like that do our score. And uh, funny enough, Scott and I did the entire score remotely. So we were working, he was in New York, I was in Los Angeles, and we would do these kind of long Skype sessions. And then Matthew would come in and he would give feedback and I was cutting a lot of the music. And that was really cool. I mean, we were in the pandemic, we had to do it. We didn't have the budget or money to like be flying Scott in and out of Los Angeles. He had to do his recordings in New York. But the first time that Scott and I met was at the world premiere in Italy. And we just hugged and Good to see you, man. But we had never met in person, which was pretty awesome to pull off a whole film score remotely. You know, you have to keep in mind, Scott's also my brother, and this was his first film score. You know, he was, like, as Matt was saying, he was classically trained. He's played, you know, Carnegie Hall and concerts all around the world, but he was in a place he wanted help on the film. He really wanted to, you know, compose. And at first, I wasn't sure, you know, that it was going to work because, you know, I had cast so many people in this movie who are like, you know, I always, always say, don't work with family, don't work with friends. I totally violated that rule on this movie completely. I just, you know, totally botched that rule. But, you know, I got to, you know, because often, you know, when a director like me, a first timer, a rookie, gets the two companies coming together, gets, you know, I can't say the budget, but more than $10,000 on Indiegogo, right? <laughs> like gets these actors, gets this, it gets this kind of financing behind it. They usually tell you, hey, look, pal, we think you're great, but don't bring your crew. And I know this because a lot of directors I've talked to have had this, right? Where they like, they get the first time opportunity and they say, we're going to put you with a cinematographer. We're going to put you with an editor. We're going to give you a list, right? You're going to go off these people. You're going to go off composers who are more experienced. You know, you're going to have all this stuff that they kind of say. And then what really happens is it's their people. It's not your people. And the director ends up walking away feeling like the movie kind of got away from them. That seems to, that's not always the case, but it's not sort of the pattern I notice. And fortunately for me, my producers, Kevin Matisau, Carissa, Afel, Gia Walsh, they really backed me. And I think part of why it was, was we had a year and a half or two where we were developing the script and trying to get it off the ground that we really got to know each other and trust one another. And they saw my vision for it and how fleshed out it was. But, you know, it's not usual that a first time director, more or less first time feature film editor up there, right? Um, you know, a first feature cinematographer, a first feature composer, right? It's a lot of first feature people. And usually they don't like to have all those people be <laughs> first feature people. They usually like, like, okay, one of you and then everyone else will be veterans. So we were really lucky that we all got to come and do this. But I think that's part of why it worked out because, you know, and we got the, we, we made the movie we wanted to make because. A, the producers trusted us and gave us that. Thank God for that, because we wouldn't have been able to if they didn't. But B, everyone was kind of in it together. This was a movie made on a mission where we were all hungry and we were all like eager to, you know, prove ourselves. And we all wanted to tell the story. And we were all kind of in it, you know, for, for the same reasons. So we were here for love. We weren't here for the paycheck, right? Because we know those didn't really come. You know, we were here because we believed in the movie and they got behind me. And as a director, that was such a luxury that, you know, Fortunately for me, hopefully as we get bigger movies, <laughs> you know, um, but we'll get bigger movies and I'll keep them on because they're, they were incredible. Well, Matt talked about just the ambitious nature of what you were doing. I mean, the term indie film, it's, it's so broad. It, it, you can have an indie film that you shoot with your friends in your backyard and you can have something like what you've done with American murder where I watched it was like, this is an indie movie. <laughs> we get that a bit. <laughs> it's based on a true story. And I know you did a short version as well, which I'd like to talk about in a minute. But first, you know, how you found the story and just the basic summary of it. Well, American Murder is about a charismatic con man named Jason Derrick Brown, who became the FBI's most unlikely and bizarre top 10 fugitive. You know, he was a surfer dude from Southern California, blonde hair, spiky blonde hair, blue eyes, good looking. It really doesn't fit the normal profile of a fugitive. So my origin story with this project was, you know, when I was 14, before I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be an FBI agent. And I used to go on the FBI's.gov website. I also found it recently, yesterday I did press with Ryan Phillippe and he told me he also wanted to be an FBI agent. I, and I said to them, I said, Ryan actually could have been an FBI agent. I would have been a desk guy. But um, I was 14. 
uh, it was in 2004, just to give you a sense of my age while we're at it. Um, and it was right around the time that the crime was committed and the movie takes place. And I used to go on the FBI.gov website just thinking, okay, I'm going to help these guys catch a fugitive. And um, on the FBI's top 10 list, you have this sea of menacing faces. You know, you have Whitey Bulger, Osama Bin Laden, you know, criminal masterminds, really like menacing dudes. And then you get this surfer dude with spiky blonde hair and something doesn't add up, who kind of looks like Sean Penn from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, right? So much so, by the way, that Sean Penn's body double has been arrested twice in the almost 19 years now that Jason's been missing. There's your next movie right there. Sean Penn's body double. <laughs> He's just getting arrested again and again. Um, I would see that. I would definitely pay to see that. Um, so, you know, it was a, it was a interesting thing. Just, you know, the image stuck to me. Cut to 12 years later. I'm out of film school. I'm figuring out what that first movie is. You know, I'm trying to like figure out how do you make a living in this industry as a freelance director and screenwriter. And it's pretty hard. <laughs> I'm learning. Yeah. And, you know, I was doing a, I was, I think I was shooting like a dentistry commercial for some like weird company like Texas. And I was drawing the storyboards out one day and I'm just sitting there, you know, and I have like the TV on in the background as I'm drawing the shots and, you know, I'm still struggling in my mind. I'm like, what is that first movie? And then all, you know, because that's all anyone's asking me. <laughs> I'm having a lot of, I have this little water bottle tour around town because the short I made of one of these wards. And so I was kind of like, you know, getting to meet a lot of people. And they're like, what's your first movie? What's your first movie? And I just, I felt like, uh, you know, I just didn't know what to say. And then as I'm drawing these storyboards out for this dentistry commercial, all of a sudden, Jason's face pops on the television. And I look at it and I see it and I go, that guy's still missing? How did that happen? And so I just turned the volume up and I started watching. Really, at first, the movie was attractive to me because here was a story, right, about a charismatic con man, had an armored car robbery, had a cat and mouse chase with an outlaw and a sheriff, so to speak, even though it's not 1800s, but, you know, had that kind of feeling of like a modern Western. So all that stuff was exciting and attractive and, you know, cool to me. But what really ultimately gave the movie, I think, an engine was this was a story about family. And it was a story about a man, a complex anti hero, someone who got in over their heads and really like did something terrible and, you know, was a pretty rotten person in a lot of ways. But somebody who meant so many different things to so many different people. Matt and I are both products of mentorship. And I have a great mentor named Billy Ray. Billy Ray is a great screenwriter and director, you know, Hunger Games, Captain Phillips, uh, a lot of great movies. And he always says, if I don't wake up thinking about the movie, I don't write it. Well, it, it is an obsession, and that's where it should start. And Matt, I don't know what you were doing at 14. <laughs> um, probably not on the FBI.gov website. Maybe you were, whatever. Um, he wasn't. <laughs> who knows what he was doing? But being a collaborator with Matthew on this, in terms of doing research and just informing yourself as much as you can about this world you're about to enter, the story you're about to tell... Anything you did to help better prepare yourself in that way? Did you research this story outside of just Matthew's script? Did you go and look for any sort of context, any sort of backstory that could help you be a more informed editor? Yeah, I definitely did some research on the story after reading the script. Also, Matthew was just kind of a well of knowledge. Like he had spent so much time researching that we would oftentimes go on lunch. We would go on walks even beforehand in pre-production before he ended up flying out. Um, to Utah to shoot it in the height of the pandemic, by the way, he was shooting in like November or December, where it was very gnarly. We were the only production in Utah, I think at the time actually shooting. And I would just kind of dutifully get up every morning, look at the dailies. And I would just, you know, the phone call never rang of like, oh, someone, you know, we're shutting down. Like, it was amazing that the guys that everybody on set, particularly our cinematographer, Cleo Robinson, our first AD, Evan Lighthill, like, they made it all through that time uh, was incredible to me. And then you see the footage coming in and it's inspiring. You're like, okay, these guys are bringing their A game when the world's not a fun place right now. So it inspires you even when I'm, and Matthew knows this, we, would, we were sitting in my apartment editing the movie. Like they were, they would send me the dailies and then he came back and a lot of our sessions were just me and my studio apartment in Los Feliz. We weren't sitting at a high end facility, any place. This was very much like all the money went on screen. All the money was there to be on screen. But I think really what Matthew gave me, which was a huge gift, was just kind of the passion. Being with him every day in the edit bay, he's very open to new ideas, but also he's got a vision. When you have a writer-director who's very much created a sandbox, 
you have some freedom to try things out. You have some freedom to move things around. And he has a movie that's very nonlinear. And so there's a lot of fun in that. But I will say that something that we would talk about a lot that I stole from my main mentor, Matt Chesta, is kindness is not a line item in the budget. It's given freely every day. And I think that's something that I was really happy about the process, really happy about how the movie turned out. But I think we were also really happy about the process as well. So I mentioned the short film version of American Murderer. Tell me about doing that short and how, if you did, you use that to parlay it into the feature. Was that something that you shopped around as a short? You know, it almost sort of reminds me of, um, of course, now I'm blanking on the film because I should have made a note. Oh, Billy Bob Thornton, uh, Sling Blade. Tell me about that process of going from short to feature. Absolutely. Yeah. So I was kicking around the screenplay and I was really struggling to get it read by people. You know, like I found that it wasn't even like, you know, sometimes people would read. And at the time, you know, to be fair, the script was not the social network. You know, it was it was getting worked on. It was getting better. Right. And so, you know, but I was kicking it around, just not getting the response I wanted. Just like not getting people to even crack it open. And look, it's tough. I used to work at the talent agency, William Morris Endeavor. I was in the mailroom and then I became a talent agent's assistant. I knew how hard it was to get people to read screenplays. Because every agent, every manager, every gatekeeper in this business has 12 scripts they have to read that weekend. So you have to fight. You know, you have to fight your way through and stand out. So anyways, the proof of concept was coming together at a time when, you know, I realized I was frustrated because I wasn't really getting the script read. You know, even though I had a very good actor attached to it. And I had a meeting at a company. They, you know, were talking to me. They were like, what's your movie, American Bird? And I pitched it to them. You know, at the time, the script was not quite like the movie you saw. It was way more focused to just Jason's point of view. It didn't really go outside of that. It was much more lean, sparse, you know, it made to be made for, for a lower budget than we did. It was not as like going through different perspectives or it wasn't even nonlinear or anything like that, right? It was very straightforward, kind of like a straight cut. These people at this company were like, okay, yeah, that sounds cool. So I'm leaving the company. I'm going to the elevator. And this young guy who works at the company chases me down and he goes, hey, man, so I got to tell you something because I like you. I think your movies are good, but those guys are not going to read your script. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, they said they were going to ask me to study. He goes, yeah, no, no, I know. But like, they're not going to read your script. They just have so many scripts to read. If you want to get this script out there, you need to make a proof of concept short. And I was kind of like, okay, but why? <laughs> like, I made these shorts. They've won all these awards. Like, I've done the shorts game. Why do I need to make a proof of concept? And the guy goes, you've proven you can direct with those shorts, but you haven't proven you can direct this. I heard it and I was like, oh, damn, this guy's right. Because ultimately, so then I had this great actor, Jonathan Groff. He was attached to the project at the time. We did a proof of concept. We shot it, right? We did it all in one seamless shot. It was like a five minute one take, basically. And that became the calling card for the movie or for the screenplay. And um, by the time the short was done, Jonathan was on a huge show, Mindhunter on Netflix. So when that dropped and the proof of concept short dropped, all of a sudden, I had people reaching out to me, and it kind of created a whole new wave for me. And it was through that, that Traveling Picture Show and GG Films both converged upon me at the same time. They had got wind of it because they saw that, you know, this concept was happening, and it was on IMDb, and, you know, I had an actor, and it was on a big show, and then they were like, oh, let's meet this Matthew Gentile guy. So the proof of concept was a serious calling card for the screenplay, the project, and I don't... I don't know that without it, we would have gotten the film made. The calling card concept that you mentioned, something that gets debated a lot is the concept of a demo reel or the concept of how an editor who's just starting out sells themselves. You know, you're kind of on the front lines. What are you hearing these days, whether it's through friends or through agents or friends agents or agents of friends? This is what you need to do, Matt, to have your own calling card as an aspiring editor. I'm not a big fan of the demo reel. I haven't really heard anyone who's really talked really well about having a demo reel. It's like, okay, I'm going to edit scenes that I've already edited. So it's like editing on top of editing. I think people want to see scenes. I think people want to see clips of, thing, of your work. You want to have work samples. And I think a really important thing about this movie is that Matthew had American Murder. But again, it was tricky to some, hire some of the people that he wanted to hire. But we kind of just started making the movie. And one thing we were doing in the lead up in pre-production is, and Matthew can also talk about this too, of what it was like as a director, but we kind of figured out this pre idea of taking what I had learned on some of these big studio films and how do we do it on a small level. We weren't using the same software. We were using something called Shop Pro, but I was able to 
you know, build a street. I was able to, you know, build houses around. So when we had a SWAT invasion into a house, we we built that. Um, we have a big sequence at a pawn shop and a movie theater. and was able to build all those things. Granted, the locations changed a little bit, but I think where we really found our collaboration and we started feeling comfortable working together and the clock hadn't started yet, so they weren't spending money yet, was doing this previs um, kind of in the pandemic on the weekends. I was working an assistant editor job at Netflix. And then on the weekends, even like on Labor Day, Matthew would come over and we would spend eight to 10 hours. We would, you know, take walks in Los Feliz or, you know, go grab a taco. And we're just doing our, we're doing our thing because we were really passionate about this movie. And I think, Matthew, how did you feel kind of the first time we started doing that and working together? And you've talked about sometimes that you felt like you were able to start getting a leg up directing. Yeah, you know, what Matt just said, I think, touches upon a really important quote I heard. I, I was watching the movie Light Sleeper recently, the Paul Schrader film. He was talking about how that movie was really hard to get funded. And Francis Ford Coppola said to him, well, do what I always do. Just start making the movie before people pay you, and then eventually you'll get paid. And that was kind of the case with previous. You know, Matt kind of called me up one day. Or we would, Actually, it was in the middle of lockdown when we were first casting the film, like March 2020. And, you know, we were making offers and as you can imagine, it was pretty hard to get people to commit, you know, in that time. And we were kind of in between, but I just kind of said, I, I kind of abided by that Paul Schrader, Francis Ford Coppola mentality of just start making the movie. So what can I do? Shotless storyboard. I, you know, my team is in their apartments on Zoom. We can do all kinds of things. So Matt and I went for a walk. We would go for walks because we live near each other. And it was one of the few things you could do with a friend right at that time. So we would go on like, Nice long walks through the Los Feliz Hills, and Matt had won the Ace and Brennan Fellowship, and you know was Mr. Young Hotshot editor, and he was talking to me about this pre-visualization software that he had gotten his hands on. At the time, I didn't know that Matt was going to necessarily get the gig, so I kind of had to say to him, "I was like, listen, buddy, I love you. We're good friends, but like, you know, if we do this, it's going to be just like us starting out. Like, I don't know that I, I can't promise you anything." And Matt was like, "That's fine." Let's just see how we work together. And we really learned to work together. You know, he got to learn how I shoot and how I block and how I, you know, and he got me directing again because, you know, keep in mind the journey to getting American Murderer made was about two and a half years or so between the proof of concept and day one of filming. So that's a long time not directing. It's a long time me writing and, you know, really honing that muscle. But the directing muscle was a little soft before shooting and doing pre-visualization for four and a half months <laughs> before we shot and Matt's a partner with him doing all the set pieces and like camera placements and working with lenses again, it got me ready. You know, it seems like certainly on indie films that editors have to wear a lot of different hats, just the nature of the beast. But also in a lot of ways, it also feels like the editor's role for an indie is also sort of to be like the CTO. I don't have a note here about who the post super was or anything like that. Not to sort of. It was Matt. <laughs> well, there you go. But it seems like an editor on an indie film really is the technical guidance. Like so much of the film, I mean, everything in the film flows through you. So in that light, Matt, tell me about your role on American Murderer, where you might have had to be that technical guidance for everybody. Yeah, I think a lot of it stemmed from when you're editing and you're editing a independent film. It, the movie gets small after production. You get to be with the director, you have the producers coming over, but then the movie starts to expand just like a bigger movie does. And you have to work with the music composer. You've got to work with the visual effects people. You have to work with the sound mixer and everybody. And that's, I think, where your role of knowing what the director wants really well, of being really on the same page with the director, and you kind of help make things happen. You have their vision, and then on a technical level, you're able to go in and really execute on the detail. Because I think what I love working about with Matthew is he loves kind of giving space and a sandbox for people to play in. But we also were able to assemble a really great team. I mean, we had Arthur Mesa, who's a really top-notch visual effects artist, who was kind of our supervising visual effects artist. He did a lot of the shots. We also recruited a whole school from... San Francisco called the Academy of the Arts. And we had grad students who were actually finaling several shots on the movie, which was super cool. Obviously, we had his brother, Scott Gentile, along with Wes Hughes, who produced and was helping me with some of the music editing. Scott Gentile, who was working remotely and just hit it out of the park. Um, great music supervisors. Scott Chamberlain, who like did our mixing and we got to mix uh, for two days at Warner Brothers, which was super awesome. So it's a lot of people coming together to help you out. And I also have to give a big shout out to uh, my assistant editor, Jing Han. She's 
going to be an editor pretty soon and I'm not going to be able to probably hire her as an assistant editor anymore because she's super talented, but she was really pivotal in the online conform. She was managing a lot of the visual effects dropping in from all the different vendors. So yes, I am managing it, but when you have a great team, filmmaking is a team sport, you're in good hands. And I definitely felt that throughout the process. So it made my job pretty easy. The title American Murder is a very bold title. And I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but it's not a grisly picture. It's, it's really about the walls closing in around someone and, and putting them in a desperate situation. In fact, I kind of got a Goodfellas vibe off the film, certainly in terms of just the feds closing in and the pressure ramping up. That's the best compliment I got all week. There you go. But <laughs> um, for the nonlinear structure part, again, you're following basically Ryan's character, the FBI agent, following Jason, Tom Pelfrey's character, and Jason digging this hole for himself and then making it even worse. Right. seems like you moved a lot of pieces around to find the film that was hiding there within the Avid. Totally. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Matthew, if you want to talk about, I mean, your script started out in a kind of a very nonlinear phase, but yeah, you talked about how the basically the first two thirds of the film was very nonlinear and the back half became linear. Do you want to talk about that a little bit of kind of some of the discoveries you made together? Yeah. So you have a lot of different vantage points in this movie we really were creating kind of a fractured narrative where you're seeing Jason Derrick Brown's character from so many different points of view. In the script, as it was written before we really shot, everything up to the end of Act 2 and the climactic set piece was all jumping around in time constantly. And it was interesting because I was a little reluctant to do that at first. It was a producer who kind of suggested, maybe try going back there, maybe try going back there. And then I said, like, guys, they're going to get confused. And my producer smartly argued back to me, well, no, because audiences are very sophisticated these days. You look at Westworld or you look at a lot of shows that are popular right now, like they're jumping around all the time. It's not to say you always have to. I love a good linear story. But, you know, this script really called for it, I think, because of the character, right, of Jason Derrick Brown. He's not linear. He's going all over the place. He's spinning lies. He's going place to place. So it makes sense the movie would kind of follow that kind of pattern. So the first two thirds of the script were a lot of, you know, Time jumps, time jumps, cut back. And then by the time the climax happened and Act 3 unfolded, because naturally what was in it seemed so tense and suspenseful to me, I had to play out very linearly. As you've talked about those Goodfellas moments where you see the walls kind of closing in on him and he's paranoid and all that's happening, I thought it was enough. I, didn't, I felt, maybe I don't need to do the time jumps here. Just let it play out because it's pretty baller. Well, then you shoot the movie <laughs> and you screen it and you know you just get the notes where you're like, well, third act feels a little unsatisfying. You're like, damn it. <laughs> like, what did I do? And what we realized, Matt and I, as we looked at it again and again, was, well, the first two thirds of the movie are not linear. You can't just have the last third be linear. It's, it's not really going to work. So you know, we kind of had like a lot of cool things happening in that part of the movie, but we didn't have a functional climax. But Matt just said, let me try something. And Matt shows me a complete helicopter car chase that he made from stock footage. And he said, I think we could do this. And he shows me, he does the music, he cuts it together. And completely as an editor, he became a screenwriter in that moment. Like he, he completely engineered a chase sequence that then we were going to do pickups. I went and we shot. And that ended up creating the climax of the movie. And that was completely found by him in the editing room. And that's, you know, what, one of the joys of working with an editor, and specifically working with an editor like Matt, is that it's, he's like, he became like a co-writer you know, and a co-director. There's a question I've grown probably overly fond of asking, but it certainly seems apropos that I ask both of you, coming off of American Murder, what did you learn, whether in terms of skills, insights about the business, anything, anything's fair game in terms of what you learned from working on American Murderer? I would say the biggest lesson from American Murder is how important team is. It was really awesome that while we were making this film that I had some great mentors through the Erickson Brennan Fellowship. And if anyone's interested in getting some really great mentorship, I would encourage people to apply to that ACE opportunity. I just had access to some really great editors that were mentoring me. So I felt like I could be a good guide throughout the process. I mean, I fortunately live a couple of streets down from Kevin Tent and Kevin Tent watched our cut and he watches like everything at Netflix. And I was like, oh my gosh, like a little nervous. Kevin Tent's watching your cut over the weekend. We're gonna get some notes back because we wanted to, you know, get honest opinion. He gave really amazing feedback that we took to heart and did, but 
to have great editors. Uh, Matt Chesse also watched the cut. Like to have great mentors that are just generous with their time is just really awesome as an editor. And when you get that example, you then can run with it and be that good example for your director and really focus on bringing it home for your director, making producers feel comfortable. So I think a lot of it was like getting those hours in the chair, getting those hours behind the Avid, not because I didn't know how to use the Avid, but like you're the one in charge running the show and you have to be organized. You have to keep people on time. And I think your job really as an editor is to put people in places to succeed. And we had all these amazing players. And so it made my job very easy and learning about how to work with people well, working with other artists and putting them in good situations, I think was a big takeaway for me. Well, just so you know, Matt, Kevin Tett makes me nervous too, but for totally different reasons. <laughs> okay, Matthew, your turn. Um, you know, I definitely learned a lot. Learning to embrace the long journey that is film making. I kind of always thought like, I don't know, I'd write a draft script. This is the last draft it's going to be. Or, you know, I'd shoot be like, oh, now the hard part's over. And it's, it's not the case at all. Or now we're editing and like, okay, well, we'll get to that cut and then we'll be done. And it's like, there's always more. So, you know, and then you finish the movie and you got to sell it and you got to promote Then you sell it and you got to promote it. You know, the finish line just keeps getting pushed further and further away. You know, as a director, a huge part of it, I think the job that I definitely did not know as much about before is how many different energies you have to balance throughout the whole process from pre-production all the way through the end of post. And as a director, you kind of have to stay with it all the way through. And that's, that takes a lot of stamina. But honestly, I'm going to you know, sound cheesy uh, and overpipe this, but uh, you know, hire Matt Allen. That's what I learned. Because hiring that guy makes me look good. I met a lot of bright and ambitious people. I've never met someone who's impressed me more than Matt. I work you know, 14-hour days. He works 18-hour days. He is the hardest working person I know. Um, you know, and someone who just goes above and beyond and for a director to have that in an editor is such a, a luxury and a gift. Matt has so much experience in the studio world as an assistant editor. This was his first feature where he really had this train set, you know, and to see him take that run with it and do such an incredible job. I can't wait to work with him on so many more movies and to any director listening, hire Matt Allen. Well, I can't think of a better thing to close out on than everybody should hire Matt Allen. So everyone, you heard it, write, write it down, hire Matt Allen. Hire both of them. They're both great. Uh, you guys pulled off really tremendous work by both of you. Probably nothing more so than how you got Ryan Philby to fall down without losing his sunglasses. That was amazing. <laughs> I'm telling you, the guy is running and then falls down hard. Sunglasses stay on the whole time. Mine fall off when I turn my head. That Ryan Philby has a gift. And if you want to see that particular talent, as well as the talents of Matthew Gentile, Matt Allen, and the rest of their team of indie filmmakers, check out American Murderer, available in theaters and video on demand. Thank you to both Matthew and Matt for taking the time to talk with us today about the state of indie filmmaking in their particular corner of the world. And no matter where you are in this world of ours, it is so easy for you to get your hands on Avid Media Composer. Even if you're on an indie budget, I think Matt Allen proved that. This last week, there was another cool new release of Media Composer, version 2022.10, that has some fun new features for you to play with. I think I saw some buzz on social media about ganging together audio groups. I need to look into that. And you should too. So check out the link in the show notes, and it will speed you on your way to all the latest with Avid's flagship NLE. Well, that is it for today. I hope you enjoyed our little tour through the world of indie filmmaking. Always good to get some new voices here on the show, especially from people who are just starting their careers. Who will it be next week? I don't know. No, that's not true. I have a pretty good idea. But if you want to know for sure, subscribe to The Rough Cut, and next week's podcast will be right there waiting just for you. Until then, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. <laughs>